So we're over the hump. Finally, after five weeks, we've been kind of unpacking this series called Weeds in My Garden, and it's blown me away. I mean, I shared last week some of the things that have been really positive and valuable for us going into this series. I mean, certainly the attendance, certainly the number of stories, the people saying how proud they are of us as a church for making it okay to not be okay, all those great things that have happened. Uh, we have baptized eight people in the previous weeks. We'll baptize two more today, another, uh, another one next week. We've got people every single week coming up saying, hey, I want to give the lordship of my life over to Jesus. All those unbelievably great things. We called this series Weeds in My Garden because the name matters. Right? It's all based on a song uh, Kendall Inskeep said in her song. She said, uh, we, I offer roses in hopes that you won't see the weeds in my garden. We could focus, you know, and kind of hide our heads in the sand and focus on the positive and only talk about the roses that grow up in the different areas of our life. But the truth is that the weeds that grow up in our garden are the things that cause us pain. The weeds that grow up in our garden are the things that choke the life out of, our, out of, those, uh, out of those roses in our garden. And that ultimately, if we're not careful, the weeds in one area of our life will pop up in another area and will take over everything and leave us completely without the life that Jesus came to give us. We called this series Weeds in My Garden because the names that we call things matter. You were born with a name. Every one of you have that in common. You were all born with a name. You have something your parents called you. Maybe your name has a story. Maybe it has a, a long story. Maybe it's something that you're like, oh, it was my grandmother's name or my great-grandmother's name. My great-grandmother's name was Armintha, so we're probably not naming any kids after, uh, after old Armintha. Um, not going to happen. So, but, you know, like we have these names. Maybe it's a family story. Maybe it's a unique story, somebody who cared about your life. I knew someone whose parents were into a, a lot of mess and a whole lot of a whole lot of story in their life. And then when they found out they were pregnant, they decided to turn their life around, gave their life to Jesus. And so they named their daughter January Dawn because January is the beginning of a new year and Dawn is the beginning of a new day. Sometimes our names have really big stories. Sometimes they're just because we're really like you know, kind of cool names. We look up the names of our kids and they go through trends where certain kinds of names are popular. Maybe you've heard of the book, Baby Name Book. The Baby Name Book was for people who um, existed and had children before the internet. Now we just Google the names, right? But when we had kids, you had to look at the Baby Name Book. Maybe you borrowed it from a friend and you looked through it and you saw them. And each of those names had a meaning. And sometimes you would say, yeah, I love that name, but I don't love that meaning behind the name. Like, for instance, maybe you were thinking, hey, I want to name my kid. I love the name Lydia, but I don't want to name my kid Lydia. I want to name my kid something that gets shortened to Lydia. So you would look for something that maybe you could say, oh, I'll call her Lydia for short. But you know what you wouldn't do? You wouldn't name your kid Chlamydia. Because, because if you named your kid chlamydia, the meaning of this word, right, uh, would, would trump the fact that it might sound beautiful. Chlamydia is not a great name for a kid, even if you can short it to Lydia, right? I mean, you can clap for, sorry, that was bad. Okay, but how about this one? Maybe you're more into Greek names. You're like, okay, man, I want something that sounds unique and original and has kind of that Greek flair to it. And maybe you were thinking that Pyometra sounds like a good name. And I guess if you were really into Greek names, that kind of sounds, Pyometra sounds kind of Greek, even sounds powerful, till you realize that it's a urinary tract infection that kills dogs. So weeds in my garden is really just a, a, a story for us. It's the story of our lives. It's the story, it's the name of a series that matters to us. We're a little over halfway, five weeks now, into this nine-week series related to mental and emotional health. And here's the thing. We all have circumstances that are good, things that happen in our life that are amazing, and things that disappoint us. Things that happen in our biology or in the chemicals in our body, and they're good, and then they have things, weeds, that pop up in these areas that are powerful and that choke the life out of it. Things that pop up in our spiritual lives. It's pretty amazing parts of our story are spiritual. Our redemption. The fact that God loves me so much that he gave his only son so that whoever would believe in him, trust in him, would have eternal life through him. That's 
powerful, good stuff. But sin pops up here too, doesn't it? Sin pops up, and if we leave it kind of going on its own, it pops up and it chokes the life out of all the other areas of our life, right? You know, names really matter in the big story of things. Maybe your name has significance, maybe it doesn't. My name has a meaning, but I rarely really honestly think about the real meaning of my name, right? My first name is Jeremy, my second, my middle name is Donald. My parents and my dad always joke, says he named me after the prophet and the duck, you know? But I rarely give thought to my real name because it just kind of becomes every day. But when I was in the seventh grade, I was on a bus and terrible things happen on buses. When I was in the seventh grade riding on a bus, bunch of kids, this was, you know, the Gen X kids. And so we were different than people didn't pay as close attention to us. I was on, in the seventh grade on that bus in the back and, and this girl named Shawnee. Shawnee was apparently in a lot of pain in her life because she just kind of expressed it as anger all the time. Shawnee got up on that bus and started making fun of me, started picking on me. And it quickly went from, from making fun on me and picking on me to punching me. She's punching me over and over and over again in the head and I'm stuck in a, in a weird place, right? I have two options and neither one of them are good. I can choose to be the guy who beat up a girl or I can choose to be the guy who got beat up by a girl. Neither of these are good options. So I just took it, right? And she finally got her fill, I guess, of making fun of me. And she stood back and took a step back. And I can remember this moment, the look on her face, the laughter of everybody in the, in the bus, when she said, you are such a goober. Now, I, I listened to that as a 50-year-old looking back at my 12-year-old self and go, seriously, that's all she could come up with? I could have made fun of her. Now, I could have made fun of her and made her cry. But, but then I was stuck. And it wasn't just that that name popped out, right? It's not just that she said it, it caught on. It caught fire, fire like it was viral before viral was a thing. It got to the point where literally nobody called me anything but Goober. And I lived in that name. It just kind of lorded over me and it was, it was huge. So much so that people met me years later and go, hey, what's your real name? I've only known you as Goober. And the worst part about it wasn't just that other people called me that. The worst problem was that I thought of me as that. See, the problem with names is that often we wind up living under them, living from them. And the worst part about our names is that we wind up giving ourselves names. We give ourselves names like failure, loser, perfectionist. In, you know, this procrastinator, or we name ourselves by our diagnosis. I am not a person who struggles with bipolar disorder. We say, hey, I'm bipolar. We don't say, hey, I'm a person who struggles with, with addiction. We say, hey, I'm an addict. We don't say, hey, I'm a person who struggles with depression. I'm depressed. You see, what happens is that the worst part of it isn't the names we get called, it's the names we call ourselves. And here's the thing that we have to understand is that there is no better document in the world to consult or talk about the names that we call ourselves and the dangers of living under any other name other than the name that God gives us. There's no better document in the world to consult than the Bible. The Bible has a lot to say about people's names. In fact, their names in Bible culture and times we're much more important to them than they are to us today. We just go by Jeremy and don't even really think about it. The meaning of their names were very specific and very real. I think of the story of Naomi. You'll find Naomi's story in the book of Ruth. Naomi's story is pretty, um, pretty amazing because Naomi went through some stuff. She went through some really difficult circumstances in her life. And they led her to a pretty dark clinical place. Like they went through some really tough things. Naomi, her name means my sweetness. It's usually in Hebrew, it would be the words that you'd say, my sweetness. You can read her story in the book of Ruth in the Old Testament. It's just a few chapters long. It'll take you about 30 minutes to read it. And it's a powerful story. Her name when she was born is the words my sweetness. It's how you would say sweetie in their language. And she operated under that. She got married had two sons, but then through no fault of her own, just circumstances, reality of life, right? 
A famine struck the land. She didn't do anything to cause it. Famine strikes the land, and there's all kinds of uncertainty. You know how the trauma of uncertainty has affected you? It was like that for her times a million. She had uncertainty of even being able to live. So her and her and her husband and their boys, they uprooted their life and moved from Israel to a place called Moab. A place called Moab that was away from their people who worshipped the way they worshipped, moved into a place where they worshipped idols. A godless place. That was traumatic for her. She moves there and her husband, her boys marry women and they begin their family and kind of kind of begin to expand things a little bit. But then her husband dies deeply traumatic. Again, circumstances that she had nothing to do with. And they just cause fractures in her life. The, the uncertainty of food, the moving from who she was comfortable with, the death of her husband, and then no longer, not, not long, much long after her husband passes, both of her boys, not one, but both of her sons pass. One more impact after another. Maybe you've been there one impact after another, and it leaves these cracks, these fissures and fractures in our life. She went through that over and over again. Her name, My Sweetness, she decided, man, I don't want to, I don't want to be known as My Sweetness anymore. I don't want to be called Naomi. She says, I want you to call me Mara, which doesn't mean My Sweetness. It means My Bitterness. She moved the circumstances, the fractures, the problems, the fissures in her life, kind of circumstantially reached over and became a clinical thing for her. She said, I want to be given over to my bitterness. In fact, she asked her two daughters-in-law, she said, look, don't call me Naomi anymore. Call me Mara. I don't want to be my sweetness. I want to be my bitterness. And I want you to leave me to buy bitterness and just go on and restart your life. But one of her daughters-in-law, Ruth, said that she wasn't going to have it. She wasn't going to do that. She was instead going to stick by her. And that's what the whole story of the book of Ruth is, is this powerful story of redemption for this woman named Mara, who has wanted to be given over to her bitterness. You know, the most important thing I want you to get today is that if you're living in bitterness, which leads to self-loathing, which is exactly where she was, right? This low self-esteem, low self-value, low self-worth, self-harm, those places are all the results of the bitterness that happens in our life when the fissures break and they take root. But God doesn't want not one single one of us, he doesn't want any of us to live in bitterness. The bitterness that we kind of adopt because of either the circumstances in our life, the biology, maybe even the neurology, the clinical things in our life or the sin, God doesn't want us to live stuck in any of that stuff. In fact, that's why he said he came, to set us free from the captivity, to bind up our broken hearts and set us free. The writer of Hebrews says it this way. He says, look after each other so that not one of you, none of you, falls or fails to receive the grace of God. Watch out so that no poisonous, look at those words, root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. Watch out together. God gave you and I each other. God gave us us so that we could watch out for each other, make sure that nobody falls down and fails to receive God's grace. It's never God's desire for us to live in bitterness. God wants more for your life than to live in a place where you redefine you. See, the most dangerous thing wasn't the names that people called Naomi. It was the name that Naomi called Naomi. She called herself my bitterness. Maybe you've called yourself a failure. Maybe you've called yourself a perfectionist in a negative way. Maybe you've called yourself a procrastinator. Or maybe you refer to yourself as an addict, or I am bipolar, or I am depressed. Those identities that we adopt corrupt and kill our character and our hearts. And God wants more for your life than you can give yourself, than you can all be given when you live under those names. Thinking of another person in scripture. Now, he's kind of an obscure character. He's not kind of a, he's not like a, a, a premier character of the Bible. 
Uh, his name when he was born was Meribaal. Meribaal. Now, if you see his name, you might call it Meribaal. Um, that is kind of the, the kind of the maybe normal pronunciation. And maybe you'd recognize part of that. Maybe you re- recognize the word Baal. The word Baal is uh, an idol in this culture. In this culture, Baal was an idol, a false god. And then he had prophets of Baal and he had all these things. And then Baal shows up a number of times in Scripture. It's technically, it's pronounced Baal. And Meribaal is not a boy who is named after a god, right? He wasn't named after an idol or a false god. In fact, Meribaal's parents believed something amazing about his life. They looked at him and said, he's not Baal. He's Meribaal, one who will stand up and oppose Baal, right? That's huge, that mom and dad looked at this young man and saw him and said, Meribaal, he will stand up and oppose. He will herald the claims of the one true God, and people will find and follow God, worship him because of our son. They had a vision for his life, Meribaal. Now, you probably have never heard of Meribaal. Maybe you've heard him by his other name that he gets changed to later on in life. His name is Mephibosheth. I'm guessing probably haven't heard a lot of Mephibosheth either because he's not a very like, prominent character. He's kind of obscure. But I think the obscurity of his life is kind of the thing that we can learn the most about when we deal with self, uh, our self-esteem or self-loathing or self-hatred or self-harm. Maybe the obscurity of of Mephibosheth's name and his story is what we can learn the most about. You see, Mephibosheth was a nobody, but his dad was somebody special. His dad was Jonathan. His dad, Jonathan, was was a big deal. In fact, he was the son, Jonathan, was the son of King Saul. King Saul Jonathan, the prince, and then Meribaal, the son of Jonathan, whose parents saw great things in him. It was kind of a really cool story. Jonathan was best friends with David, who had ultimately become the king of Israel. This is, the King Jonathan, or, or Jonathan and King David and King Saul were all significant characters in the story of Scripture, in fact, in the Israelite people. But Meribaal, He's a tiny little player. He was insecure and insignificant. Didn't matter at all about his life. He was a young man whose parents believed a lot in him. But then through circumstances like Naomi's that were none of his own fault, he experienced some trauma and some pain that just over and over riddled him. His grandfather, Saul, he, he walked away from God consistently. He kept doing, rebelling against God, so much so that God eventually came to, to Saul and said, look, um, you, if you want to do things on your own, that's fine, but I'm taking the throne away from you. You can do things on your own. And then eventually he kept rebelling and kept rebelling and kept rebelling. And then God came to him and said, Saul, if you want to keep doing things on your own, you can, but you're no longer under my protection. You, you can choose to leave the protection uh, that I provide. And you have done that. You're doing that. And he, re- he rebelled. In fact, God told him, don't go into this battle. He went into that battle anyways. And because he had a faithful and, and con- consistent son in Jonathan, Jonathan followed him into battle. The battle that he wasn't supposed to be in it was no fault of Maribel's. He had no fault in it at all. He was just a little boy, five years old, honestly. He's five years old when his grandpa and his dad go out into this battle they weren't supposed to be in. They lose the battle. The people take the bodies of, of Saul and of Jonathan and they, they viscerate them and they hang them up on the walls of their city as like a trophy to see, for the world to see. And there's a vacuum of power. The, the king and his son are both dead and hung up for the public to see. And there's a vacuum of power and everybody's scrambling. And Meribaal is at home with a nurse who's taking care of him. And she's, trying, she's worried that somebody's going to hurt him. And so she gathers him up quickly and runs with this little five-year-old boy. The circumstances are piling in on him, right? She runs with this five-year-old boy and trips and falls and breaks both of his feet. And both of his feet aren't able to be set correctly because of the unrest that he experienced. So he walks for the rest of his life with a limp. 
He was born into, into privilege. He was born to live at the palace. He was born to live in, in, the, in the royal family. He was born to live in the succession of kinghood. He was born to be king one day, but instead the circumstances of life took everything from him before he even knew he had it. Man, the circumstances of life are brutal. Whether you, whether you run into life or life runs into you, man, it leaves a mark. And it did on Maribel. So much so that it changed not just his circumstance and his stances in life. It changed how he felt about himself. So time goes on and David, the best friend of Jonathan, grieves Saul. He grieves the passing of his friend Jonathan. In fact, he says this in 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 1. He says, Is there anyone still left of the house of Saul to whom it I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? He's like, Jonathan was my best friend. And I miss him dearly. Is there any, does he have any descendants left? They kind of pass that around and kind of get somebody. And then he finally gets to this man, this man, and he says, listen, he, the king asked, uh, is there anyone alive from the house of Saul to whom which I can show kindness? Ziba answered, there is still a son of Jonathan. He is lame in both feet. That's weird to say, right? Now you know, this is Maribal. He's lame. He's, he's hidden both. He, he has a funny limp because they couldn't set his legs right. A few verses later, they say, he, David's like, hey, go get him. Bring him to me. I want to see him. And so he brings him. And by this time, he doesn't want to be known anymore as the man who opposes Baal. He doesn't want to be known as Meribaal, the one who stands up against, the one who heralds the claim of the king, the one who causes people to lead and to worship the one true God. Instead, he changes his name to Mephibosheth. And when Mephibosheth, Mephibosheth, hard to say, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he bowed down to pay him honor. And David said, Mephibosheth, at your service, he replied. And then David says this to him, don't be afraid, David said to him. He had reason to be afraid, right? I mean, as the grandson of King Saul who died and the son of David who died, it would be at least a little bit worrisome to David maybe that Mephibosheth, that Meribah wanted the throne. And he's like, listen, don't be afraid for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan, I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will always eat at my table. Now, here's, that's a pretty crazy story, right? I love Jonathan, my friend, so much that I will gladly take care of you for the rest of your life. Look at his response. Mephibosheth bowed down and said, What is your servant that you should notice? A dead dog like me. A dead dog like me. Maribal, born into prosperity. Maribal, born into privilege, born into royalty, born into stuff. He was born into power, born into everything that matters. And it was all taken from him before he was even able to recognize what its value was. Circumstances hit him hard. And it caused him to get to this place where I don't think this is hyperbole. I don't think this is exaggeration. I think he really feels like a dead dog. So much so that he doesn't want to be known as the, the one who opposes Baal. He wants to be known as Mephibosheth. He wants to be known as the dead dog that he feels like. Have you ever been there? You ever been there where you're like, man, I don't know if you ran into life or life ran into you, but man, sometimes just circumstances are so overwhelming that it's not just the circumstances anymore. And it's not just that you want to be left to your bitterness. It's that low self-esteem creeps in. This bitterness takes that deep root in your life, winds up being self-loathing, low self-esteem, eventually self-loathing, self-hatred, self-harm. We get to a place in our life where those, that bitter root that, that, that the writer of Hebrews said, don't do, like watch out for each other and make sure this doesn't ever grow up, is kind of gives root to it. And man, the problem with self-esteem is that it's rooted in self, isn't it? I mean, the problem with our self-esteem, low or high, 
is that it all begins with self. Now listen, if you have struggle with low self-esteem, I'm not saying that you should just not care about that struggle. If you're struggling through low self-esteem, low self-value, that, that's a difficult and real place to live. But can we just be honest with it? We have to understand that if I'm only going to pursue self-esteem, that it's really only rooted in self. See, the word esteem means respect or value. To have self-respect or self-value isn't really going to fix the need. What we really want is to be esteemed and valued and cared for by others. And here's the thing that's the struggle often, is that we don't always think that other people will ever esteem or value us. And we think that other people won't esteem or value us. We begin to have low self-esteem or value. Same thing happened with Maribel. He's like, listen, nobody's going to look up to me. Now my grandfather, my dad are dead. My royalty's removed. My power's removed. All of my, my privileges removed. All the, all the things that everybody wants are removed. Nobody cares about me. I might as well be like a dead dog. Nobody will ever esteem or value me, so I don't esteem or value myself. The problem with self-esteem is that it's rooted in self. I'm not saying that you shouldn't care for yourself. Because if you go to a counselor, they're going to give you really good advice, aren't they? They're going to say things to you like, man, you should try some positive self-talk. You should speak kindly to yourself. Good advice, right? You should keep a gratitude journal. Man, good advice. You, maybe you should try something like treat yourself like a friend. Good advice. I mean, good advice for all those things that we do. Go, Hey, listen, I'm going to learn to take compliments. You ever notice when somebody compliments you that you try to convince them that they're wrong? But learning to take compliments can help us with our self-esteem. But can I say this? Even if you have a positive self-esteem, it's still based in self. That God wants something more for us than the way we value or esteem ourselves. Not that we shouldn't value or esteem ourselves, at least in a healthy way, right? We are, after all, a creation of God. God put you on the face of the planet for his honor and his glory and your full and complete and satisfied life. God wants greatness for your life. So you should value and esteem yourself to a healthy degree. But if that's healthy, the rest of you can still be unhealthy. We need more, right? We need more than good self-esteem. Self-esteem is not bad, but we need more than that. Don't you need more than that? I need more in my life than just a new, good, positive self-esteem. Because there's a part of me that still lives under the names that I've given myself or the names that others have given me. There's a part of me, a very young, immature part of me, that still feel, feels like Goober on the bus. There's a young part of me, or a real part of me, that feels like a failure that feels like a procrastinator. There's a part of me that feels like, like I'm always never, I'm never going to measure up. There's a part of me that feels like I'm my diagnosis. There's a part of us that feels like, and I don't know about you, but I need a new name. In fact, I would say that I need more than a good self-esteem. We need a new name. I need a new name to live by. I don't need to change my name, Jeremy, to some other name, right? I need to find a new name to live by. And just like what we've seen all throughout Scripture, God gives us a new name to live by. Abram, wasn't, Abraham, we know him, wasn't born Abraham. He was born Abram. Abram means honored father, right? And then, but, but his changes his name, God promises, and then changes his name to Abraham, which means honored father of nations or multitudes. He elevates his name right? His wife, Sarai, born Sarai, means my, my princess. But God says, hey, listen, I've got more for you than that. And he changes their name to Sarah, which means my queen. My princess was good. My queen is better, right? He had to, Jesus does it too, right? He does it with, with Peter, his friend, Simon, son of John, which is a really close friend to him. Simon is a good name. It means good listener. And that's a good thing, right? But Jesus changes his name. You're no longer known as Simon, son of John. You are Peter. You are the rock. And on this rock, I will build my church. See, God cares about the names that you live under, the names you live by. And he wants to give you a new name. 
And here's the thing that I think is so powerful. Revelation chapter 2, verse 17 says it this way, And I will give each one of you a white stone, and on that stone will be engraved a new name that no one understands except the person who receives it. Now, when I read that, it's a little bit unnerving because I can go, wow, that's great that I get a new name, but it's way out there, way out then. Can I tell you that God's plan exists outside of time and that God already knows the new name that he has for you, the new name that you are learning to understand right now. He says he'll give it to you and you'll understand it then. But here's the deal. You're learning to understand it now. You're living the life that God wants to rename for you. It's such a powerful name that we can't even really handle it right now. But God has a new name for you to live under. And that new name isn't just a brand, right? It's not just, hey, we'll call you something different and kind of recognize all the same things about you. He says it's more than just a new name. It, you are a new creation. Paul says it this way. He says this means that any one of you who belongs to Christ, any one of us who's in a real, intimate, God, you have my life sort of relationship with Jesus. We become a new creation. The old is gone. The new life has begun. You know what's so important about this? So that's exactly the picture that baptism is. The baptism is not a special event. Baptism does not save you. The grace of God is what saves you. But baptism represents for us this moment when we, when we bury the old you. Look what it says. The old life is gone. That part of you, if you are in Jesus, that part of you is already dead. If you are, if that person is just waiting for you to bury it and for you to resurrect a new life, Jesus, God doesn't want to just give you a new name. He wants to make you a new creation. So let me just invite you to this. Every single week at the close of these, we're just being asking people, if you're in a place now where you're like, look, I want to give the lordship of my life over to Jesus. I want to give my circumstances. I want to give my biology. I want to give the chemicals and, and the neurology and the clinical and spiritual parts of my life over to God. If you're in that place, then can I just ask you to do this? If you're here with us in the room, I would love to meet you right over here, right after this service. I'll be right here by this baptistry. I'd love for you uh, to come over, and I'd love to shake your hand and get to know you, and I would love to help you take your next step toward Jesus. You can meet me over there. If you're not wanting to swim upstream and, and make it up to the front of the room, or maybe you're joining us online, you can go to ourjourney.news, and on the bottom corner, you'll see a right, a little orange circle that says next steps. Just click that and just say, I want to follow Jesus today. I just want to follow Jesus today. I don't know what all the yesterdays have looked like in your life. I don't know if it's a whole bunch of regret or maybe it's a whole bunch of spiritual story. But I want to follow Jesus today just means I want to move forward and take my next step. And when you fill that little form out, it's going to give me a little bit of information and I'll call you this week and I will help you figure out the very best next step for you to take because I want you to have a new name. I want you to be a new creation. Because that's what God wants for your life.